friends, we are so big and complex as a country. Almost anything you say is both true and untrue at the same time. We've had two perspectives, two different presentations of reality. Both are realities. In some ways, it's perhaps my pleasant task to try and bridge the gap, connect the two, how to synthesize. On the one hand, the strength of our families, the march of technology in the 21st century, and the entrepreneurship of our people, including that reflected in this wonderful hall. These are really encouraging aspects, and that's what Sanju Mehta is talking about. We cannot say that India today in 2019 is the same as India in 1979 or 1949. It's absurd. I remember a time when a mobile phone, or even a telephone, was unthinkable. All of India had only six million or so telephone connections. You had to wait for years, paying in those days a princely sum of 8,000 rupees to get one your telephone thing. And today there's not an Indian who did not, or does not have a telephone. The first time I saw mobile telephones in the UK with my chauffeur, I was filled with wonder and envy. It's wonder at the, at the enormous convenience and envy because when will my country get it? But within a decade, it happened. So we cannot say all this is not progress or it's not reaching the people at the grassroots level. Government, to some extent, some infrastructural improvements, some regulatory improvements, some delicensing, a little more of economic freedom. Some of those things are happening. And a nationwide GST with some teething troubles, but certainly a common market is a worthwhile thing. And therefore, that's the glass half full part. There's a glass half empty part. There are two ways of looking at ourselves as human beings and as a society. One is that I am better than yesterday. The second is I could be much better than this there is a gap between my potential and my performance. There's also another perspective. There's somebody else who has roughly the similar opportunity along with me, but she has done a lot better. I am falling behind relatively. Unless we have these two perspectives of what is my potential, what is my performance, and how is my competitor doing with a similar advantage or disadvantage, and where am I, I think we'll be in a self-congratulatory mode. It will be easy to fall into a rut. No, after all, we are doing better. Even if the governments in India sleep 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, we will progress. In some respects, actually, we will do better. <laughs> because the governments have become disabled. I'm not one of those anti-state people. My life has been in government. Arunaji has uh, left government quickly, but I was there for quite a considerable time. I was there for 16 years. I left it I, and I worked with joy in government. As I hope I continue to work with joy outside government. In my mind, there's no distinction between these two, it's just a hat. So I'm not saying out of anger or bitterness, but we have to recognize the practical realities. Why is it an inflection point? You know, in each generation, every five years or 10 years, we think it's an inflection, history is being made. But perhaps there are some issues where this becomes a fairly significant moment in our national history. The promise of 2014, for instance, and the promise of 1991. Some things happened since 1991. Sanju Mehta talked about that. But if you look at the big picture, there's a certain feeling that opportunities are squandered. I think it's a fair assessment. It doesn't matter if you belong to the left or right, this party, north, south, Hindu, Muslim. I think it's universal that opportunities are squandered. Two, globally, and perhaps nationally, four big changes are happening. It's not business as usual. 25 years ago, globally, the climate for us, not environment, natural climate, I'm talking about business climate, economic climate, was very hospitable. Trade barriers were declining, immigration barriers are coming down, the rich world wanted the poor world to do well, and so on and so forth. Today, we all know what's happening. It's shrinking, that opportunity. 
technology has become so incredibly disruptive that it's impossible to believe that such change is actually as he is there in front of our eyes. I mean, 20 years ago, I would not have believed that such a dramatic changes in technology in the next quarter century are possible. But today, the world is radically different. And in the next 25, 30 years, the patterns of production will change so dramatically. And some of it, you guys here in Cambridge are pioneering in MIT or here or elsewhere. And this whole additive manufacturing and a whole lot of other things. The world of the future, the economies of the future are not going to be anything like what we have seen even today. And therefore, we can't simply do business as usual. Within the country, there's a breakdown of the reconciliation between the short term and the long term. So far, some effort was made. I have to take care of the poor today and help them. After all, there is distress. And I have to build a future like every family does. Do I take care of my child's education, assets for tomorrow, health care, and an opportunity? Or do I take care of my today's consumption needs? And we all do that negotiation in a family, and that's how India, despite everything else, is prospering because the families are thrifty. They sacrifice everything for the children's future. There's one unifying feature of India, Hindu or Muslim, North or South, Brahmin or Dalit. We all love our families. We all are willing to pay the supreme price for our families. There's not a family where the parents say, my children's needs are above my needs. It's very Indian. If a nation does not have at least a part of that ethos, if current consumption eats into tomorrow's future, the children's future, then there's a problem. Suddenly, in the recent times, you see a dramatic breakdown of that reconciliation between the short-term price you have to pay and the long-term good that you have to pursue. An inflection point, a dangerous inflection point. And a fourth one, the world was extremely benign to us in the past quarter century because they were desperately hoping that China, that monolithic giant, a potentially authoritarian giant, an ultra-nationalistic giant which could swallow everything around it, is growing and you cannot stop it. Will India grow and be somewhat equal to China? And will India play that role of moderating China's influence? Not necessarily in conflict with China, there was this unspoken compact. Much of the world wanted us to rise. We thought it was our birthright to rise, and it would happen automatically as a miracle because we are all very fond of mantras in our country. We never realized that to make it happen, there are some things to be done. And because we haven't done enough and in time, I don't think anybody seriously now believes that India could be a serious competitor to China, at least not in the medium term. And another inflection point. 20 years ago, it was talked differently. So there are issues here. What do we do then? Let me, I want to put up a slide, but good that it's not there because I'm, I'm very pained about that. I've done a survey of the 49 large economies of the world, taken by GDP, more than $200 billion per annum, GDP. India, out of the 49 countries, consistently ranks in the bottom five on every single indicator that matters. I'm saying this with a heavy heart. The aggregates are good. We are now the fifth largest economy. We have overtaken Britain probably sometime now or last month. I mean, the, Britain is 4% of our population. After all, we, we should one day overtake them. And The next major country would be Germany, that will take quite some time, but after 10 years, maybe we'll overtake them. Then will be Japan. Again, it'll take some time, but we'll overtake that. Sheer numbers speak. But averages are what matter. It is not the wonderful scholars at Harvard from India, while they represent the best of us and what we're capable of, they do not represent the reality of India. There's a confusion between our understanding of the best that we're capable of and the actual thing that we're able to realize in general. Bottom five. And which are the countries in our company consistently? Pakistan. I don't understand why we're fighting with Pakistan. <laughs> Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria. The fifth country kept changing depending on the indicator. 
Then I have done a quick survey of six countries. All right, let's take China, Malaysia, Vietnam, three countries in varying stages of growth phase in Asia, South Africa, Mexico. Every single indicator, India is ranked below each one of them, except per capita income where Vietnam is lower than India. But despite that, on every other indicator, Vietnam is better. The point is not that, my God, things are bad. The point is that there's a lot we can do without too much difficulty. And we have failed to do that. If we don't recognize that, this triumphalism and business as usual will lead to less than happy consequences. Let me come to the concluding point because the organizers are very concerned about time. <laughs> a country of 1.3 billion people cannot have one shoe fit all mechanism of doing things. It simply will not work. It never worked anywhere. It never worked in China. A joint secretary in government of India in Delhi cannot design what should happen in Thelonia in Rajasthan or Husnabad in Telangana or Gudwada in Andhra Pradesh or Hosur in Tamil Nadu. It's absurd. Unity is not uniformity. All of us are dedicated to the unity of India. There's not one person notwithstanding what some, what some polarizing figures will say, whether it's Asaduddin OIC, or Aruna Roy, or Sanjeev Mehta, or Pankaj Saab, or I, or all of you. There's not one Indian in India or abroad who does not want to see the united, harmonious India with a great future. <laughs> it's the world's greatest experiment of assembling the most diverse peoples and making them come together and work together. It's a fantastically successful experiment. But unity is not uniformity. Take Jammu Kashmir. I did not want to say this, but since Arunaji raised it, forget everything else. If you take the opportunities presented, let's say, in, in the last decade, 2011, 78% people voted in Jammu and Kashmir peacefully against braving the threat of boycott by the terrorists in the local elections. A fantastic opportunity, bungled. 2014, there was a spring in the step and there was confidence in the future. Bungled, because like any other state, how many MLAs I have, how much money does it make, and how will be in this seat, this seat, that position. Bungled. There are many other things. Pakistan, the security angle, ISI, army. But if we don't make our population, our people feel partners, create a stake for them in the future, if you see any effort at diversity as a threat to unity, if we try and impose uniformity at the cost of the aspirations of the people, we always have a challenge to the future of our country. That's the broader context. Last 20 years have seen some significant improvement in terms of our federalism. We no longer have Article 350 dismissing governments at will. We no longer have very arbitrary kind of a allocation of resources. There's a rule-based allocation increasingly. Many, many things have improved. Good, but not enough. We require flexible systems to suit local conditions. Let's look at the rest of the world, United States. The federal constitution is about federal government. Each of the 50 states have their own constitutions about the system of government, bureaucracy, local governments. Take Canada. There are no state constitutions, but all federal governance models are made by federal law with the state's consent. Each state has its own federal law. <laughs> Take Germany. Each state has its own constitution, Article 20, Article 30. Each state has its own constitution. And Article 28, each local government has its own autonomy. Take Australia. Each state has its own governance model. It's not imposed by the federal government or by the federal constitution. Take even Britain, a unitary Britain. In Britain, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, all have different electoral models from the first-past-the-post system of the British Parliament. Altogether different models. It's a unitary country, single religion, single language, single culture, single history. 
London city has a direct elected mayor. European Parliament in Britain is elected by proportionality model. By imposing a uniformity in the name of unity, we have undermined both unity and progress of the country. My plea, therefore, is let a thousand flowers bloom. Let the constituents units of India, while strengthening the unity of the country, have the ability to determine how to design their institutions the way the government is elected at the state level, the way the local government elections are there, the constitution actually tells you how you should conduct a panchayat election in Haryana or Rajasthan or a municipal election. How the bureaucracy is run, the same bureaucratic framework applies to the cabinet secretary to a panchayat level chaprasi, article 3 level, etc. If you want to acquire land, the parliamentary law decides how you should acquire land in your village irrespective of the local popular perceptions and the local realities. Whereas the vote is always for the state or against the state. The electoral unit is the state. Therefore, true federalism and strengthening and empowering local governments, even local government model because it's imposed from above, it never allowed to, was never allowed to flourish. Until 1990s, scores of leaders emerged in India from local governments became prominent nationally and at the state level. Post 1990s, not a single significant leader emerged from local governments. There's a reason, a design issue. Yeah. And therefore, let us do what it takes to strengthen further the unity of the country. Federal offenses, a Lokpal, Lokayakta system which controls not only the, the federal functionaries, political and bureaucrat, but also state functionaries, bring them under federal law. And a system of, and other systems of accountability. But let us give the states and local governments and cities a chance to flourish. What an autocratic China does to empower its local governments if a democratic India cannot do, democratic India will meander, India will not disappear. There are two choices at this inflection point. Either fulfilling our potential by unleashing our energies and making many of you, there are so many people who came up to me and asked me, we want to play a role, what can we do? We don't have a ready answer because there's no way of absorbing the energy of the people of our country. Unleashing the energies and allowing them to participate and make a difference, or continue the business as usual, meander at a low level equilibrium. And five, ten years later, talk about another missed opportunities in this Harvard seminar. I wish you all the very best. Thank you.